This talk is titled A Quick Way to Get Your Small Talk to the Web. And uh, this is a, a research, a very nice research idea that I tried to, to follow uh, in the last months. And I had this idea uh, in June, so it's not so major still, but I think it was enough to do some research experiments and to present a paper here. And um, well, the idea is, let's see. Um, so there are quite a few small talks uh, that run on the web, different implementations that do different things to um, to be able to get the small talk code work on a web browser, right? So I think Amber was one of the first ones. The the approach was to um, basically. Uh, mimic the small talk behavior of objects being sent messages with JavaScript behaviors. Uh, you can mimic the, the small talk uh, hierarchy in JavaScript uh, because the languages, while different, they are not that different. So you can uh, basically create prototypes that mimic the small talk classes and try to implement all the small talk um, semantics on top of that. Uh, that was one implementation idea. Then there is a squeak.js, which uh, tries to mimic a small talk, a squeak small talk as much as possible so that you can load a small talk image of a squeak in the browser and that it runs as it runs in the native world. And there's also Faro.js, which tries to create a framework where you can execute a small talk code that you develop on Faro, but uh, you deploy it to the web, right? And uh, there are different approaches. Uh, they are all fine. Uh, what I wanted to, to think was if there could be a, some way to abstract the idea of small talk semantics and to create the general mechanism to uh, to port any small talk to the web. So if I had to port a small talk to the web, uh, well, can I abstract some ideas? Can I extract something from uh, that is the root of the small talk execution and port it to the web so that it could work for any small talk? So the idea was um, to try this uh, this notion with one small talk, um, which uh, which is B, and um, at that point, let me recap a little bit of my personal background and why I had this idea. So uh, I've been working for the last ten years on BDMR, which is a meta circular version of B where you don't have a separate VM layer and you implement the JIT compiler, the garbage, the garbage collector, and all the glue calls of, of what usually and traditionally is a VM in the language itself. And so you don't have a virtual machine, right? And we uh, open source that uh, small talk and uh, we created a repo with all the source code and we wanted to make some uh, big changes to the uh, to some parts of the system. In particular, we generated the image from a previous image, like we do traditionally in Smalltalk. We save the image with new changes, and that's our new Smalltalk. We wanted to bootstrap from scratch, so we created a bootstrap that was called Powerlang. And well, Powerlang basically try to follow the same approach that we had with B, which was to generate uh, an image from uh, from a specification or from a, a set of source code files of the B kernel, and then to generate native code for those objects in the image. So it was kind of a BDMR, but bootstrap from scratch, right? So we have to deal with native code, we had to deal with different architectures. And uh, in the first iteration of that design, we'll take the files of 
uh, of B in a in a standard format. We will read them, we will generate an image, and we will use a, a bootstrapper to generate native code. So the idea is that in Faro we, we see this this gray box here is Faro. So in Faro we load um, this specification. We have a, a class which is the bootstrapper. And uh, we had to uh, initialize the objects in the image. So we did a small interpreter to initialize the objects there. Um, so that we, we will create a first iteration of the image where um, we would connect all the objects there and then we would send them initialized to the classes so that we would have a working image, right? And when we had, uh, that image, we will from Faro, we will nativize all the methods in the image uh, that we were creating. And so that we will write um, a file, an image file that had all the native code for all the methods in, in that bootstrap system. It was a little bit complex because we had to write the nativizer here in Faro. And the idea was that we will have the nativizer also inside the bootstrap image, so we, we didn't want to duplicate. And we went to a, a, a different, a, a little different approach, which was, okay, let's take all the objects that we just created. The interpreter ran on some spec-based objects, which were objects that did not depend on their uh, pointed class to execute. That was just an implementation detail I wanted to mention. Um, so when when the interpreter here tries to implement, uh, tries to uh, to send a message, it doesn't look for the class in the in the object as you would normally do in a small talk, but it it went to look to the specification and look there for the class and look there for the method. So in this second design, th uh, this was the first design. The second design, we moved to a more Metacircular um, approach, which is the typical traditional in Smalltalk, where each object has its class uh, and the class has all the methods. The idea in the first approach was to do this because the, the objects were not were not complete, were incomplete while bootstrapping, so we couldn't send initialize and expect everything to work because some some things were were broken. But well, after you have initialized, then you can migrate your objects to fully metacircular, fully working objects, like in every small talk. And so in this design, everything basically works in a simulated world, uh, in a simulated world, yeah, uh, because everything is running on top of Faro. So each object here is actually an instance of a, a Ray 5 object for the bootstrap system, but you can send them messages, right? So you can send them a message to write a kernel image segment, and they can, for example, generate native code um, as we do, uh, as we did before in the in the original system, but this time the nativizer is, is, is inside the simulated image. And when looking at that, I said, okay, but we have an interpreter, we have an abstraction, for the runtime, everything here is in the small talk level. So we are writing this in, this in small talk code. We have an abstraction for a method frame, for message lookup, for inline caching. We have basically the, the virtual machine minus a JIT compiler minus um, also a garbage collector, right? And well, in JavaScript, you have a JIT compiler you have a garbage collector, you don't know they are there, but you have them. So maybe we could just uh, take this little thing here and uh, translate it to, to JavaScript so that we can uh, generate uh, a VM in JavaScript, uh, basically from our VM in Smalltalk. So, <clears throat> Oops. Uh, what we can do instead of generating an, um, a native kernel is that we can 
tell um, our, our simulated image to generate a, a JSON kernel. So a JSON kernel is basically an image, but instead of having objects that point to other objects, we have uh, basically a JSON file where each object is encoded in some particular way, like uh, in a map that has all the properties. It has some particularities like, uh, well, in JSON, you cannot have uh, circular references, but you can solve the problem uh, in different ways, encoding objects in some, like an object table, and then um, generate an image for that uh, for that uh, web image. So on one hand, you have this JSON kernel. On one hand, you have this that you have to transpile, right? So basically, from Faro, we have this evaluator. In, in our case, it was an interpreter. Um, you have uh, a runtime, which means, OK, uh, it has a knowledge of uh, where are things are, what is the shape of each kind of object, like a method dictionary. If you want to look for, for the symbols, you have to, uh, you have to go to, to the fields and, and search for the symbols. Well, the runtime knows all that. So you had to basically transpile this, and you are going to have some evaluator in JavaScript, written in JavaScript. You are going to have some runtime uh, written in JavaScript. You have to write this transpiler. So you, you can basically do this by visiting the AST of each method here and transpiling it to some JavaScript code. We, we are going to see the shape of that. Uh, in, in a minute. You can do this for each class here. And now in JavaScript, you even have classes. So you can have a class file for each class in Smalltalk. So this evaluator becomes a class in, eval in this evaluator shape script and the, for the runtime. And for each element uh, of this system, for each class, you have a class here. And then <clears throat> you have to use this kernel JSON, which uh, has to be loaded. So we are going to add some uh, uh, glue code to be able to load this and to generate a new instance of this. And there we, we have basically a, a JavaScript system that can load a small talk system uh, encoded here and execute it at this, as is. So let's see how this transpiler uh, changes the, the code or how, how it generates uh, JavaScript code. So this is code for the VM, right? Uh, suppose you have in your VM code this method that says, I don't know, that uses a non-local variable here and that has a temporary and instance variable. And here there's another instance variable. Well. This is something that has been, for example, done in uh, in Faro.js like this. So, for um, <clears throat> for each uh, temporary here, you generate a temporary here. Also, uh, the instance variables here are part of a class, and are part of a class here. So you declare them in the class. In Smalltalk, when you define the class here in the class declaration, which is not in the screen but you also have all the instance variables. For each selector, you basically change each uh, semicolon with uh, an underscore, and you put all the symbols together, right? And you can uh, create a small talk blocks, transpile them to lambdas in JavaScript, which are very similar with just one difference, which is that they don't uh, allow to do non-local returns. So you can emulate, emulate that behavior with exceptions. This is something that is done in Truffle too. It is a framework I'm going to talk in one minute. And basically <clears throat> uh, you throw an exception when you want to return from a code, from, uh, from a block. And that exception is captured in the method, in the base of the method. And that uh, if that exception matches with the with the environment we created that method, 
then we are just returning from, from the block and we can execute the code. Um, so uh, what's the nice thing about all this is that we are changing here, for example, the, the symbols, but we are not changing them for all the code in, in, in Smalltalk uh, in the small talk image that we want to execute, but only for the VM. So the VM is very simple. It doesn't use perform. So we don't care that the symbol here is different to the symbol here. So if we had some small talk code that used perform, this wouldn't work because it wouldn't find add semicolon if absent. But we, the, the VM doesn't do that. So this is general enough to work for, um, for the VM that doesn't use perform. And this VM also doesn't use exceptions, small talk exceptions. So we don't need to, uh, to deal with small talk exceptions. We don't need to deal with does not understand. So basically it works uh, well enough for transpiling the VM and that's all that we need. And we, we can have uh, all the small talk features that we usually have in small talk, at least for execution, um, we, we are not talking about, uh, uh, for example, how to implement some primitives in Squeak.js. There's the need of uh, enumerating objects. We are not dealing with that problem here. It's just only to the level of execution semantics. And I think that for that, it's, uh, uh, it's enough. Um, so how, how the whole system design is, uh, basically, um, you have uh, <clears throat> your evaluation, your evaluator, sorry, and your runtime, which is transpiled to JavaScript. Here it should say evaluator.js, runtime.js. And you have some glue code. Um, I could show an example later, but uh, I think I won't expand too much because I don't have much time. And so, <clears throat> uh, here you have uh, an image, well, not an image file, but a library file or a module file for each thing that you want to, to use. You start with a kernel, so you create a kernel JSON. You will load this with the, with the model reader and the glue code. And then your system can just have different modules for FF5 or for file system. So one of the interesting things here is that your kernel doesn't need to have the memory manager because you are not going to manage your objects. You are going to use JavaScript objects. You are not going to have a JIT compiler because that's going to be done by the uh, JavaScript engine. And well, here the FFI is going to be uh, with JavaScript. So if you want to go out of your system, which runs on small talk, you will have to uh, work with JavaScript. Uh, you have like two minutes. Uh, okay, so I'm I'm finishing. Um, some okay, so related work. All this, the small talks that I mentioned before are related in, in different ways. There is also a very similar approach uh, done by uh, by the Truffle framework. The Truffle framework is a framework where you can write an evaluator in Java and execute it in a Java VM. And uh, Fabio Niphaus has uh, implemented Truffle Squeak, which runs uh, a Squeak on top of a Java VM. I think the idea is very similar, but in this approach, you write your evaluator in the Java language, which is the, the host language, right? The, the VM runs in Java, so that's the host, and you write in Java. So uh, in, in our approach, we are using JavaScript as a host, but we are writing the, the, the language or uh, our language implementation in the guest, which is a small talk, right? So that's that's a pretty big difference. And I think that we can, uh, we, that this is something for future work, but we could implement actually any language, I think, for, with this kind of approach. Um, so uh, the interpreter is very naive. It uh, basically verifies all the uh, all the frames, all uh, the execution semantics in Smalltalk. Uh, we could optimize uh, this with uh, from the transpiler. While transpiling, we can generate optimized code that has uh, well less um, uh, less verifications. 
there so that the JavaScript version is more efficient. And we could also uh, do some kind of G transpilation so that instead of interpreting the, the, the small talk code as we are doing, uh, we can generate JavaScript code that uh, is going to be um, compiled by the, by the JavaScript engine. And um, well, uh, that's it. So thank you. Uh, if there's time for questions. Thank you very much for your. So we have time for some questions. Um, I wonder if you have questions. So Juan. Hi, Pocho. Um, I wonder uh, what are your expectations, not so much uh, on what, how well it performs today, but how much room for improvement uh, for performance you see and how that can compare with what uh, Squeak.js could eventually do. Which one of them you see could eventually get better performance? Okay, so I think that both approaches, while different, have more or less the same uh, performance uh, limitations, right? Um, it, this uh, this version that I showed here, um, I got it to run more or less as fast as Amber Smalltalk, right? I I'm not sure if it's uh, like for maybe four hundred of one hundred slow times slower than a traditional Smalltalk like uh, like B, in, in running native. Um, <clears throat> I I can't remember right now the numbers. But uh, so this is a very basic version. And uh, for, uh, for the limitations, well, I was talking to Vanessa and I think uh, uh, we, we had the same limitations because she told me that in Squeak.js uh, with, uh, with basically a JIT compiler, you can make it run. Uh, so the, the bytecode interpreter is more or less the same speed than, than this. But with a JIT compiler, she made it run ten times faster, right? So we get closer to the uh, um, <clears throat> to the na native um, version. And she also told me that uh, there are some other optimizations that could maybe give some even some more times better speed. So uh, uh, for our case, I also did a, a, an experiment uh, similar to what she did. Um, I mentioned it in the paper that with some experiment uh, I could get 10x uh, improvement in speed, and it was uh, basically transpiling the the intermediate representation. Uh, so generating JavaScript code not only for the VM but for the intermediate representation. The intermediate representation uh, has uh, similar uh, properties to the VM, which is that they the intermediate representation doesn't need to use all the features of the of, of the small talk system, but you can generate JavaScript code that uh, covers generation of the of this intermediate representation uh, in a very simple way, and you can get a, a 10x um, improvement performance. So maybe uh, with very few work, you can get a system that works. Uh, 10 times slower than your uh, traditional small token native uh, with a native virtual machine. But on the other hand, this runs on most most computer systems in the world, right? So you get everything. And then you can also, with, with what I said before, um, uh, transpilation optimization, you can also optimize the VM because you take your, your code of the VM, which verifies everything and you say, okay, but for this particular case, I'm generating JavaScript that doesn't need to verify uh, maybe the frame or doesn't need to verify uh, the shape of the objects or the object header. So you can remove all that during the translation phase. So you can get even better performance. Uh, let's Okay, I think Ken has a question and then Juan, if we can make it. 
Yeah, you're obviously learning things about, uh, you know, as, as B expands to more systems, uh, uh, how to sort of package and minimize the bootstrapping procedure. Uh, the obvious uh, thing here, even if it's not necessarily fast, uh, is the uh, self bootstrap where you uh, take uh, maybe part, perhaps something on the web and then write a nativizer uh, that runs in that framework to nativize for uh, platform X, you know, particular architecture X or Y or whatever. Mm -hmm and uh, you know, turn the crank there so that this becomes its own uh, sort of uh, universal bootstrap for whatever architecture you want to run on. Uh, what are your thoughts about, you know, what, what are your tendencies to go this direction? Well, okay, so, uh, uh, for a universal bootstrapper, I think uh, it's a little bit too much. We, we try to start a project to try to bootstrap any system and then we, uh, it became uh, a little uh, bit hard to to do that. So, we, um, especially with the first approach that we would um, that that I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the talk, that we would not devise the code from the outside uh, to generate the native image. Uh, that definitely was it was clear that it, it wouldn't work for. Uh, for any system, so it would work only for B. In the second approach, I'm not that sure, but still, um, I think it would be hard to to do a, a bootstrapper for any system. Uh, but still, well, there are things that can be taken out that can be sold and from there you can, and it's open source, so it's it wouldn't be stealing. So if you want to bootstrap other system, you can just take the code and, and use it. Uh, the the ideas are um, uh, are the most important thing I think and and the code you can just take it and adapt it to to the small talk you want to use. We have a a question from Gishe. I don't know if that is going to be short one. So I will try. <laughs> uh, so I, I I find it interesting the the choice for. Uh, modeling the image. So you have a, if a JSON object where you have the objects. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so I wonder, I don't know if you have thoughts so, or just give some comments on, uh, I imagine that if you have a large program that actually will impact in the, in, in the startup of the system. So it will take time to load and time to actually parse and blah, blah, blah. So uh, mm -hmm. waste maybe, what do you think, how this will scale and how to optimize it better maybe for large programs? Okay, yeah. Um, we haven't tried to optimize that much that uh, because uh, we are generating uh, an image only for the kernel and the kernel is only uh, one megabyte, right? Actually, it's less than one megabyte. And the idea for at least for B is to, to be able to use modules so that your program will not load an entire image. It will load only uh, the kernel and then the modules you need for your image. And we plan to do uh, web development uh, or not web development, development using the website uh, environment that Gisha Maral showed uh, some time ago in the ISAC. So basically you won't have, for example, the IDE loaded with your program in the traditional way. Uh, so I guess that the image size is not that much of a problem, but yeah, we if if we wanted to load an, a complete image, we would need to find ways to compress it. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we have a question from Juan. Actually, uh, what I propose is that if Juan could actually make the question and then we answer the question after uh, the Q and A session of the next talk, if that is okay with all of you. Well, maybe the answer is very short. The question is short indeed. Uh, is there an easy comparison about the memory overhead between um, SquidGS and, and this work? Uh, I think we should answer it later. <laughs> okay, thank you very much.